Good morning. Welcome to Gay Street United Methodist Church this Labor Day weekend. I hope that that means that uh, this is a weekend where you've had a, an opportunity to pause a little bit, perhaps to see some family members. I noticed we have at least one college student back with us here today. So these are all, all things that we give thanks to God for and thanks for the opportunity to work in the world in so many different ways. I have a few announcements here today that are slightly instructional, so please be patient um, with, with as I go through some of these things. First of all, just a reminder that uh, we, are, we invite you to wear masks here in worship. There's, there's masks at the doors, the various doors. There are nice um, new masks if you went, oh, yeah, it's out in my car because I'm not back in the habit yet again or something. Um, welcome to do that, and that would be helpful, especially around our young folks who are in school and have um, need to still be wearing masks. So I wanted to start off and remind you of that. And our meetings will continue to be um, both people, those who are on committees and so on, will continue to be virtual or have a be hybrid that you can be here in person or join us by Zoom. We'll continue doing that for a while yet. And this is also why we will continue to have communion. I'm so excited we're having communion because we haven't had it since June. But we'll be continuing for the time being to have communion at the rail um, with, with um, you know, bread itself in a cup, um, also little individual breads in a cup, and, and, those, and the juice in a cup, so that we can do that with a little more, you know, not passing amongst the pews. So just to, to let you know that we're still very aware of these things. We're going to be starting a variety of things this week. Children's Choir will begin on Wednesday, yay, and the Wednesday night dinner. And uh, Wesley Ringers are going to start their re regular rehearsals this week. And next week we'll be uh, kind of having a kickoff for the choir season. And the youth group is going to start meeting and youth bells next Sunday, and so on. So we know that in each of those places, we will be, you know, setting up, rehearsing, and so on safely as we go into some more of that programming. We do have a new administrative assistant, assistant in our office. We recognized Jan last week, but that's to. Re but let me remind you, that means we have a new person in the office. So we're still getting used to things, and she had quite the week because not only the bulletin, but a newsletter and e-devotionals and many different things that she's still learning to help Rhonda out. Um, you notice that there is a, a little information sheet attached to the bulletin. Um, and we do invite you, because she needs to start getting to know names. You know, and names, even little things like who comes to which service and all those things, or if, you're, if, if we have visitors. So please use that, put your name and anybody who's with you on that, and write clearly and <laughs> to just sort of help her out there. You don't need to put the address if you're, you know, a, a member or know that you're regular enough that we have your information. So you don't need to worry about that, but please put the date and your name clearly on there to help out Rhonda and make her Monday, or no, it won't be Monday this week, but make her morning go smoothly as she looks through those um, little information things. Another thing, without Jan as kind of the person who did a lot of our connecting for prayer concerns, um, I would invite you on Sunday mornings to use the bright green cards that are in the pews. We used to kind of collect them during the service and use them for morning prayers also in the service, but I, I would like them to be something that helps us maybe update prayer concerns. So use those bright green um, prayer cards are in the pews and drop those in one of the offering plates as you as you leave or hand it to me after the service we're going to have a you're invited anybody who wants to come a regular prayer group on Tuesday mornings that we pray for prayer concerns and maybe follow up with some of those as well so we're starting that this week and that will use those little bright green cards if there's something to update prayer concerns so with all of that information which is important because this is the way we live and take care of one another i welcome you again um, i invite you to stand and look around and see who's here today and show you know wave at each other let let people know that you're glad they're here Good morning. Good morning. smile with your eyes behind your mask see who's around see who you might want to say something to don't forget the balcony and the folks who may be watching us through streaming. Good morning. Now, 
now as you as as you are seated uh, and we are listening to the prelude i want you I, we can use this time this labor day we can just to reflect and be thankful to god for the work that we have done in our lives maybe the jobs that we've had and and thankfulness for being able to use use our lives to do things for others we'll prepare our hearts and minds as we listen to the prelude and welcome the light of Christ into the sanctuary I invite you all to stand and join me in the opening prayer. Generous God, we thank you for your kindness toward us. Thank you for loving us all and calling us all your children. Help us to recognize our King and give our lives to peaceful family relationships with all creation. Free us from our self-centeredness and from the fear of strangers, so that we may meet the Savior in broken humanity, even in our own. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.
We're joining in Hamilton Tunes, page 864. Well, pardon me when I get there. 846. Ah, that would have better, wouldn't it? <laughs> Was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had been the Lord who was on our side, when the foe brought us up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive, and our enemies came in against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, and the raging waters would have gone over us. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us his prey through their teeth. He has taken the word from the snare of the The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who has given us. every day. Stir up in us a desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and help us to vote each day the Son of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be in thy name. Your thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. They will lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom of God, and the power of your glory forever. The scripture reading this morning comes from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 17 in the Common English Bible. My brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, Here's an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person you say, Stand over there, or here, sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Don't the wealthy make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good name spoken over you at your baptism? You do well when you really fulfill the royal law in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. 
and by that same law you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Anyone who tries to keep all of the law but fails at one point is guilty of failing to keep all of it. The one who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery but do commit murder, you are a lawbreaker. In every way, then, speak and act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. There will be no mercy in judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. From the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, beginning with verse 24. Jesus left that place and went into the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know that he had entered a house, but he couldn't hide. In fact, a woman whose young daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard about him right away. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, Syrophoenician by birth. She begged Jesus to throw the demon out of her daughter. He responded, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But she answered, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Good answer, he said, go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. When she returned to her house, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. After leaving the region of Tyre, Jesus went through Sidon toward the Galilee Sea, through the region of the Ten Cities. Some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged him to place his hand on the man for healing. Jesus took him away from the crowd by himself and put his fingers to the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Looking into heaven, Jesus sighed deeply and said, Ephatha, which means open up. At once his ears opened, his twisted tongue was released, and he began to speak clearly. Jesus gave the people strict orders not to tell anyone. But the more he tried to silence them, the more eagerly they shared the news. People were overcome with wonder, saying, he does everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who can't speak. This is the word from the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It's kind of shocking what Jesus says to this Syrophoenician woman, isn't it? I always find it a bit shocking. I mean, here's this woman who has come, but she's, she's desperate. She's a mother in trouble. She finds Jesus even though he was trying to hide, and she, but she's one of the first who hears and makes her way to Jesus, you know, gets there as fast as she can. She totally abases herself. She throws herself at his feet, you know, face in the dust or the dirt or wherever it was that he was standing. There she is, there she is in humility and humiliation at his feet, begging him, to heal her daughter. Imagine that. And what does Jesus say? It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The dogs. He's calling her a dog. And when they were talking about dogs in Jesus' day, it is not the beloved pets and part of our family <laughs> that dogs are today. This is not a nice thing. This is dogs as a vermin, dirty, stinking, garbage-eating pests. That's what more the dogs were in this day. And this is what he's saying to her. More or less saying, no, you're an outsider. 
You are, this is not something I have to do. It's not right to give this to you. It is not my business. It is not my job to help you. Imagine that. What are we supposed to do with that? You know, we who are followers of Jesus and church people, we're church people, which means we are followers of Jesus, which means we look to Jesus when we're trying to figure out how do we treat one another, what do we say to one another, how do we love each other, we look to Jesus. And can you imagine being in this situation with somebody desperately in trouble and saying something like that to them? What do we do about this? James helps us as church people, to also look at how we treat one another, how we love each other, how we speak to one another. That's really important to James as well. And he has two different things that he asks his readers to imagine in what we heard today. Imagine this. Imagine this situation. It's kind of like their little parables. And, you know, parables work because we see ourselves in these stories. He's telling them true stories of things he's actually seen them do as church people. And he's, and he's saying something about it. He says, imagine this. You know, that somebody, somebody is naked, and I, I'm going to assume it's not naked, naked, but, you know, inappropriately dressed. Doesn't, it's the wintertime. The implication is it's cold. They have no coat. I mean, I've seen a lot of people in, this, in the town of Mount Vernon in the middle of winter without socks, without coats, with torn clothing. It happens right here, you know, among, in our midst part of our communities, and he says, that you see this person, and you know they never quite have enough to eat. And you say to them, you know, because, you know, we're church people, we say, peace be with you. Stay warm. Have a nice meal. And that's it. Imagine that. He says, what good does that do them? You're basically saying, it's not my job to help you out. It's my job to believe and say nice words to you, maybe pray for you, but that's it. And, and James is saying, no, just having faith is is and claiming you have faith is not your only job in fact if you do it that way your faith is dead what does it good does it do that person unless you're actually physically helping them in some way you're not actually having the faith that says love one another is one of the most important things i do and he says imagine this the two people come into our gathering you know, so this sounds like something he's seen. Two people come into the gathering. One is obviously wealthy. Their clothes are nice. They've got rings on their fingers, things like this. And you make a whole big deal about them. Oh, sit over here. This is the best seat in the house. This is important. And then another person comes in dressed in rags. And you say to them, oh, you can sit like, sit behind the pillar back there so we can't see you. Or even worse, he was saying for the people inside, sit at my feet, which is where slaves sat. That's been, this is getting pretty close to calling them dogs. He goes, but he's seen this. What are you doing? He's, she said, you're breaking the law when you do this. The royal law of the kingdom of God. And the head of that kingdom is our King Christ. And he says, you're breaking the royal law when you do this. And if you want to do this, re realize what you're doing here is you are judging people based on something that we shouldn't be judging people on. And you know we do this kind of thing. It's, it's human nature to do this. This is an age-old problem that we kind of look at people for what we can get out of them, even in churches, or how, you know, how they might give in some way, even in churches. And he says, this is breaking this royal law. And if you want to act this way, then you're just being evil-minded judges. He's not saying all judges are wrong. He's saying there's a right way to judge and to look at people and, 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 and see you know, what you can do to, to work with them. And he goes back, he's actually going, this little thing about favoritism, he's actually going back to Leviticus um, and the holiness code in Leviticus. This is, we have kind of a love-hate relationship with three chapters in Leviticus, uh, chapters 18, 19, and 20, because there's a lot of laws in there about do this, don't th do that, this is moral, this is immoral, this is, you know, this is how to be pure and holy as God is holy, which is why it's called the holiness code. And the trouble is we have a tendency to pull out certain laws and say, you know, those are the laws. If you break those laws, you're in trouble. But not notice, as James points out, that if you're going to follow those laws, you better follow all of them. Otherwise, you're, you know, you choose to do that. But he zeroes in on a few verses in chapter 19, 15, 16, 17, 18, which is about judging and being judged. If you're going to be a judge, you don't show favoritism, first of all. That is, you don't give special perks to the poor. 
and you don't show deference to the rich. You know, either way, you just have to be fair about it. You look at them as human beings. And if you're going to be a judge, no, all this is also your kind of code of judging that uh, you don't slander people, you don't take revenge, you don't hate in your heart. You know, th these things you have to speak about people and feel about people in certain ways. And here's, it even gets trickier if you're going to be a judge. You don't stand by while somebody's blood is spilt. You don't tolerate violence or people being hurt. And you do anything you can to keep that from happening. And you don't stand by if somebody is falling into sin to their destruction and their separation from God. We don't just say, oh, well, that's too bad that that happened. And the sum of those four verses is love your neighbor as yourself. James is basically working up to that again. He goes, this is it. This is the main thing. You follow this, and just like Jesus said, this is the summation. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's all the law and the prophets. And, and James calls it the law of freedom. The law of freedom. Why is it called the law of freedom? Because and when he's talking about mercy, this is a law of freedom. We realize that we, we, we can't judge because we have been judged. God judged us. And God judged us mercifully. We are sinners. And God looked at us and judged us and said, I love you anyways. That's God's mercy. And we've experienced that. And that sets us free to be merciful to others. That's what it's all about. When faith and works comes together, we have been set free to be merciful and to love our neighbor as ourself. Remember what Jesus did with love your neighbor as yourself? Somebody said, who's my neighbor? He tells the whole Good Samaritan story in typical Jesus fashion, turns it upside down, and at the end of the story he goes, so who was the neighbor? And the right answer was, the one who showed mercy. James says, mercy overrules judgment. Mercy, mercy, mercy. So let's go back to Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Because we know the story didn't end there with that line about the dogs. The woman is right there still. Something is going on here that we don't even see. We don't always see mercy happening. We can't even see what's happening this moment. He has said this to her, but she comes right back at him and she says, Lord, even the dogs under the table, though, get the crumbs that the children drop. Even the dogs under the table get some of the bread of heaven. Some of the bread of heaven and the word from God. And Jesus says, good answer. And here's what I love. He doesn't say, good answer, now I've decided to heal your daughter. No, he says, good answer, go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. It was happening while they were having this conversation. He gives her this opportunity to stand up for herself, to make her case, to be a person in his eyes. And he has already shown her the mercy that she was begging for. Isn't that an incredible story? Mercy that has been shown to us. It's what we remember when we take communion. We take communion with joy and gladness because we are remembering what God has done for us and shown us mercy even while we were sinners. That's what it's all about. Mercy is not just our job. It is our joy. Amen. We certainly have a lot of opportunities to do and to be and to show mercy and to give in all the things that are going on in our world today. So many different ways to love our neighbor as ourself. And this is a chance to thank you and, and be joyful about the ways we get to do that as a community church, as a community, as a church, as the people of God, as a connection in the United Methodist Church. Last week, I said thank you, reminded you of ways that um, the United Methodist Church connects to do things in Afghanistan and is connect, making connections to help refugees and resettlement of refugees. Today, you know, last Sunday we prayed for those in the pathway of Hurricane Ida. And I want to, you know, follow up with that uh, to say, to remind you that when you give, 
uh, a lot, you know, a portion of that, we call it apportionments, our shared ministry, goes to the United Methodist Church. And the bulk of those dollars come back in some way to local churches, to districts, to conferences. We have a conference level disaster response teams. Many of you know this because we know this because Jason Fraser, you know, one of us um, headed up our East Ohio Conference disaster response team for a while. Districts have disaster response teams. We are ready for disasters. United Methodists tend to be second responders. The first responders, you know, who are there, once you can get in when the floodwaters come down, United Methodists are there with disaster response teams. We're fast on the ground. We're prepared for that. This is one of the things we do as a church. Um, and in the Louisiana Conference disaster response team is, is responding already. And the other conferences in that area and surrounding that area are responding right away with, you know, the first things that need to happen, the tarps for the roofs and basic stuff, water coming in, all those kinds of things. And some of you may, uh, may know that there is a, di like we go to the Midwest Mission Distribution Center that's close here. There's a, a major distribution center, Sager Brown in Louisiana, and that has escaped the storm. So they're gonna be able to also respond to the disaster. But thank you, you're part of this, we're part of this. We get, to, we get to be part of this mercy in the world because we dedicate our lives and our ties and our gifts and our offerings to loving our neighbor as ourself. Thank you. I invite you now to stand as we listen to and sing the doxology and hear our prayer of dedication. <laughs> you now to open to the inside pages of your bulletin where you'll find our communion liturgy and just there are some instructions in there at the communion time we'll be coming up to the rail from the front pews back so just as you come up the center aisle just as there is a place available at the rail you can stand or you can kneel and there each person there's two cups per person one has uh, the piece of bread in it all the bread is gluten free um, and, and a cup of juice for each person. Uh, have the bread first and then drink the juice just as you're ready for it at the rail. Take the cups with you when you go and either throw them away. There's a couple of trash cans and you're going to go be going back down the side aisles or you can take it back to your pews and put it in the little cup holders. If, it, if um, you're not comfortable coming up to the rail for a variety of reasons, you know, just being for spacing or mobility issues, um, our head usher, Marsha, has a tray, and you can kind of raise a hand, and she'll come to you with the tray and, and serve you communion where you are. So now we go into this joyful time of the coming to the table of mercy and grace together. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Father God, like the immigrant woman at Tyre, we desperately need your healing presence. We know we are not worthy. We are like soiled rags. However, we know that with the power of your grace, you can make us as clean as fresh snow. Touch us, O oh God. 
Break down the walls we have placed around our hearts. Breathe a new breath upon us. Strengthen our resolve so that we can do the work you have called for us to do. Help us tap into that fountain of living water that will quench our thirst. On this day, give us a word that will soften the hard-hearted. Show us your face and fill the tabernacle. Stir up a fire in our hearts like on the day of Pentecost. May that fire purify our hearts so that we shine like pure gold. Shake us until our chains of bondage are loosened. Then we can run and tell the world your story. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Please come to the table and share in the bread and the cup with your brothers and sisters.
Let us pray. We thank you, God, for this holy mystery. We admit that we're not even close to being holy. In fact, that we're more like holy with holes in us. We want to be wholly yours. And we thank you for your holiness that touches us, in which we can experience forgiveness and mercy and grace and love. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to stand and sing our last hymn together, Open My Eyes That I May See. the grace of God, the mercy of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit working within you. Amen.